Greetings, everyone. This is Michael Nagler from the Meta Center, and I'm reporting into you for this uh, episode of, of the uh, Nonviolence Report. There is, uh, as usual, a lot going on. There's a very interesting angle on the um, probably the most uh, intense and uh, difficult conflict going on in the world right now, which is uh, the uh, overthrow attempted overthrow, attempted so far anyway, in Myanmar. And uh, let me just hear a little bit. Uh, One interesting angle is, I'll have a lot to say about the Myanmar conflict in a little bit, but an interesting angle that is in an article in the New Yorker is the internet access. You know, there's such a, a, we, we make such a fuss about the technology that's available or not these days. And uh, the internet access is complicated because if the regime shuts it down, which they want to do to stop the protests from communicating, then the country can't function. It really needs their internet. And if they have it up, so are the protests. So uh, just one of the interesting little complications that's come up in modern nonviolent action. As I say, more on me and more in a minute. Uh, D.C. peace teams, you know, Washington, D.C. peace teams is definitely uh, doing its homework, I'm happy to say. They are reporting on the outcomes of their events, recent events, around the January 6th attack on the Capitol. Uh, well, that sounds strange, an attack on the Capitol. We're talking about our own Capitol. Well, uh, they will be providing the raw material then for history and uh, and best practices as we go forward and learn our techniques and improve. It, it, around this uh, same time, there's a typical peace team action that's coming up that isn't domestic. It's uh, meta peace teams, M-E-T-A with one T, and they are now recruiting volunteers for an action this summer, an intervention which would be in Israel-Palestine. And I just wanted to read to you some of the language from their description because it is uh, so instructive and so typical of how peace teams are organized and what they do. So they first state that they have been invited, and that is an important principle that's always followed. I I didn't think it was all that important, but uh, I, I, I probably was wrong. Uh, that you only go where you have been invited. That's a way of avoiding what's called peace imperialism, you know, where we march in and say, here's here's peace, whether you want it or not. So they've been invited to place an international peace team in the West Bank by Palestinians. And I'm reading again. By Palestinians who are committed to nonviolence and striving for justice under occupation. So that's another important principle. We try to limit our services to teams that are communities that are committed to nonviolence uh, for the obvious reasons. And the next part I wanted to stress is that team members will be prepared through an extensive training program. So prior to departure, people will be taught how to do uh, civil, unarmed civilian protection, which is the main activity of peace teams these days, human rights monitoring and reporting, extension of that, how to use protective accompaniment most effectively, and other creative tools of nonviolence. The preparation also includes learning the culture and history of the Palestine Israel difficulty in the West Bank. And they go on to say living conditions can be kind of basic uh, where they'll be working, and they may include staying with Palestinian families. So I've always said that the the basic training would have to be three parts. It would have to include uh, local conditions, which was the last one I just mentioned, uh, basic principles of nonviolence, and the specifics of uh, accompaniment and other activities done by these teams. So Myanmar in the news again. Uh, I'm a member of the Peace and Justice Studies Association, which is a professional association 
for Peace Scholars, and on the 16th of March, they will be doing uh, a conversation called Myanmar, Hong Kong, and Egypt, from Activism to Strategy. It's uh, the first webinar in a new series, which they're calling the Improving Practice Webinar Series in this year. And they will be sharing their thoughts on keeping a peaceful movement. Uh, with, uh, with uh, One of the participants will be the author, Lisa Schirsch, who has been one of the important historians of the nonviolent movement. And she's working now with a group called uh, SNAP, S-N-A-P, and that is an acronym for Synergizing Nonviolent Action and Peacebuilding. And that is an action guide, and she'll facilitate the conversation. So we have more uh, learning formats that are being added to our repertoire, and all that is very much to the good. Meantime, uh, this is something similar. Nonviolence International, that was started by Mubarak Uwad, Awad and is based in Washington, D.C., on the 10th of this month, March 10th, at uh, 10 a.m. to 11.30 a.m. Eastern Time, that's uh, 7 our time, and it's called Resisting Occupation, Connecting Palestine and Western Sahara. So obviously, uh, our colleague and friend, Stephen Zunas, whom we interviewed recently, who is really the foremost uh, news conveyor about Western Sahara, uh, and a serious conflict in Northern Africa, which we would have known almost nothing about. And I don't want to go back into all of the details now, but uh, he's an expert both in Palestine and Western Sahara, and he'll be one of four presenters. And this is actually likely to be a historic webinar, because it's one of the first public discussions between Sahrawis and Palestinians who have a similar struggle. It's about their occupation. It's about a struggle for uh, justice under those conditions. And uh, there are now more than 100 countries which have historical claims of some kind or another over neighboring territory. You know, think of China and Tibet. And uh, if we start using those as making an exception to the uh, prohibition against the use of military force, and we start doing interventions in all of them, you can imagine how much violence could unfold. Well, now to look at Myanmar for a moment. Uh, the last uh, we heard, there are almost 40 people, protesters who have been killed. Uh, and the military government is increasing its use of violent tactic, tactics to attempt to deal with the mostly peaceful protesters. Now, that mostly is an important qualification because the fact is even a little bit of violence can mitigate the nonviolent impact of an episode. So there are some episodes of protesters who have thrown Molotov cocktails at the police, which, of course, has only resulted in further escalation. But on the other hand, they are finding increasingly creative ways to protest. They're blocking traffic. There's something called an onion protest, where they drop bags of onions on the street and slowly go around picking them up so that they can't be accused of illegally disrupting traffic. And uh, then they're boycotting the lottery to disrupt an important source of income for the regime. Reporters have been refusing to attend press conferences with the new government, that is the military junta. And uh, some of these methods really are questionable. It's like a curse campaign, which consists of naming and shaming generals. I think in Gandhian principled nonviolence, you would never do that. You never do anything to compromise the dignity of a person, whoever that person is, in any way. And uh, when you think about it, all of these varied tactics fall into the general category of what we call obstructive program. 
what I have yet to see. That doesn't mean it's not there, but what I have yet to see, and certainly what's yet to be reported on in the news is what we might call constructive program, where people will be creating schools and community organizations and so forth. Well, to move on now to another resource, uh, even in death, it seems, the great Abdul Ghaffar Khan is making peace and making contributions to nonviolence because his biography, My Life and Struggle, has recently been translated and, and just come available uh, to us through uh, India. And what's interesting in particular is that this publication was a joint venture of India and Pakistan. So it, there is an increasing consciousness, in fact, among the Pakhtun community, or what used to be called the Patans, uh, who are against oppression and war, and that has led to a resurgence of interest in Bachar Khan, his powerful weapon of nonviolence, his emphasis on including women in all walks of life, his belief in religious tolerance, his legacy of speaking truth to power. Now, all these things are of increasing relevance. And Malala Yousafzai, who is Pakhtun, and who is the youngest person to ever receive a Nobel Peace Prize, she said this, Bachar Khan's message of the power of peaceful protest for liberty, equality, and justice change our culture and customs forever and inspires me every day in my activism for girls' education and women's empowerment. Well, uh, there's so much available now, and uh, it's uh, rewarding when it's not bewildering to consider it, but Pace Bene, the Franciscan organization, is doing a six-week workshop, which will take place on Zoom. And I'm particularly fond of this one because it's called Compassion as Presence, level two. There was a level one. Level two of applying meditation for nonviolent living. You know, I have long felt that meditation is going to be the most powerful tool that we can use for any kind of nonviolent or constructive work. So it's a two hour workshop. It's going to be Tuesday, April 6th from 2 to 4 p.m. Pacific time. And they're going to have some of the foremost authorities on the Kingian nonviolence in education. The uh, facilitator of this will be Veronica Polly Cottage, and it'll cost $80. Uh, the, there's a new book uh, called The Glossary of Civil Resistance with a uh, quote, I mean, sorry, The Glossary of Civil Resistance, a resource for study and translation of key terms. And this is being brought to us by the International Center for Nonviolent Conflict. The authors are Hardy Merriman, who's the executive director of ICNC, and Nicola Barak Yousafi. So it's taken them six years to create this. They have defined over 150 key terms, used them in sentences, have extensive commentary and introduction, and links to translations of key civil resistance terminology in 31 languages. I have yet to see this wonderful resource, but it promises to be really excellent given the quality of the work that is done by ICNC. So uh, moving around the world a little bit, uh, in a historic refer referendum that took place recently uh, in Ecuador, in uh, a region in the city of uh, Cuenca, which is the third largest city in that country, voted to ban mining in the area. And that was uh, more than 80% of the electorate voted for that. Meanwhile, the Peace Alliance, based back here in Washington, D.C., has listed a number of ways that people can get involved this month. And you can find that on the Peace Alliance website. I won't go into all of them here. But they do point out that there are three interesting bills before Congress. Uh, H.R. 350, which is a Domestic Terrorism Prevention Act. H.R. 666, hmm, that's an uncomfortable number, isn't it? 
uh, which is called Anti-Racism and Public Health Act. And finally, the sponsor of this one being uh, our Oakland representative, Barbara Lee, H.R. 1111, to finally establish a Department of Peacebuilding, something that was originally proposed, if I'm remembering correctly, in 1784. So, you know, you don't want to fool around with peace. Uh, there will be an introduction to a restorative justice workshop also on March 6th, and an advanced one on March 20th that the DC Peace Teams, who I mentioned before, will be doing. And you can get their information on uh, DC Peace Teams website. One more thing, meanwhile, from Meta Peace Teams, I mentioned uh, a big resource of theirs coming up later. Will be called will be a workshop called Stories of Nonviolent Tactics De-escalating Tension. Uh, you know, as as we've known for some time, when it comes to teaching people how they can behave and what to do, nothing seems to be as effective as stories. Uh, it's a book, uh, several books in the education field have kind of established that. You can try to explain to young people why they should behave in a particular way. It's not likely to have much effect. If you tell them a story, even if you don't tell them the, uh, the meaning of the story, the impact at the end, uh, they will get it from that narrative because they identify with the characters. So I mentioned that things are heating up in Myanmar. Unfortunately, the same is happening in India, where the government also has been increasing their tactics, unethical as they are, because they have been made increasingly uneasy about the protests. So they've been doing things like cutting water, electricity, and telecommunications for the activists who are camping at the protest locations. And this escalation of theirs seems to be backfiring as it's drawing in tens of thousands of new protesters. And this is a good example, what George Lakey used to call a dilemma action, where you put your opponent in such a position that if they don't re try to repress you, of course you win. And if they do try to repress you, you also win because the, the backlash that we're seeing happening now in India. It still remains a very tense situation that requires changing in tactics and uh, another way of approach uh, because the, the protests and the, rep and the repressions are just being very costly and not really seeming to move the conversation forward. Uh, so as you see, I am jumping around and back here in the USA, uh, there was a petition calling on the President Biden to stop the Line 3 pipeline project, which is in Minnesota. And again, the issue, just as with Standing Rock, is fracking of oil versus the fresh water supply. The uh, indigenous people, in this case, are the Anishinaabe. And uh, he has, re he, because he has blocked the Standing Rock protest, uh, he's now being called upon to follow suit and do the same thing with Line 3. So once again, we seem to have a lot of... Um, conflicts a lot of campaigns that are hanging in the air in the meantime. The Institute for Local Self-Reliance has launched a campaign to build 30 million solar homes with a focus on localism. Remember Gandhi's Swadeshi, localism? They're not just looking at energy. They have other initiatives that they're looking at, such as a community broadband network initiative and an independent business initiative. And these are really good examples of constructive program where you build what you need instead of, or at least before, calling on the regime to stop doing something that you don't want them to do. And also, there's a, there are three cities in the U.S. that are switching to what they call life-affirming economies. And you can f read about that in Yes Magazine. So that is the report for now. As you can see, there's a mixture 
of good news and bad news from the point of view of outcomes, but the overall movement in terms of the development of nonviolence, its sophistication and learning tactics is improving dramatically, and that is bound to be uh, creating an impulse or a force for a better future. So that is the episode for this week, and I look forward to reporting again with you soon. Thank you. Thank you.